know, George, I know that fixing boats and maintenance is a constant ongoing thing. Yeah. But there's also some fun. Oh, so absolutely. Tell me about some of your favorite places you've been. Oh, that's so, uh, so tough because there are so many. But I guess clearly uh, Barra de Navidad, uh -huh. I really enjoy. And uh, lots of people do, lots of cruisers do. It's uh, got a really nice vibe in the little town. There are tourists there, but it's not overly touristed like some parts of Mexico are. It has a beautiful lagoon where you can anchor for nothing. Uh, lots of birds, exotic birds around, so it's kind of fun to take the dinghy around and enjoy photography, take some pictures. Um, and there's also a five-star luxury hotel there if you want to go that route. Wow, sounds fun. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah, so you're looking forward to the Sea of Cortez this next season. Yeah. Is there any place there that you're really wanting to go to see or heard about? or? Um, no, uh, I think there's lots of places. Clearly one of the attractions is the really clear water and the good snorkeling and it tends to be more remote. Uh, a lot of little fish camps and that's a pretty interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. One of my other favorite places I visited was Isla Isabela, mm -hmm. which is often referred to as the Galapagos of Mexico because yes. it's uh, pretty remote. It's about 90 miles from the nearest uh, shoreside port and it's known for the blue-footed boobies, which so actually have those. blue feet. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty exotic. Uh, the birds and the iguanas are totally unafraid of people, mm -hmm. so you can walk right up to them, which is very cool. <laughs> and it's also quite beautiful. There's some pretty amazing spire-like rock formations off the island. Right for photography. Oh, yeah. That's great. So, is there anything that scares you when you're underway by yourself or just anything about cruising that makes you nervous? <laughs> uh, getting run down by a ship. Oh yeah? Uh -huh. so I've had close calls a couple of times yeah. and it's pretty terrifying. Um, I also get a bit nervous about having to do it overnight so that's mm -hmm. kind of one of my challenges for this year mm -hmm. because I, I'm not one of those people that find it easy to stay up all night so that's going to be difficult. Okay. So what else can we ask? Do you have a favorite sea story? Oh, there's so many sea stories. Once you get me started, well, <laughs> you can get rid Just of the ones one. you don't like. Oh, I can't. Because <laughs> they, they have different points, okay? okay. Uh, some are kind of funny, one's scary. So uh, I'll give you one that was actually uh, published, and that's kind of a scary one. And it also may answer one of your other questions about things that you've learned from. Uh -huh. And I was cruising uh, up the California coast. I just made the passage along the Big Sur coast, which is a very rugged coastline. Yes. Uh, it can get quite windy and rough off that coast. And the weather forecast said there was a great big storm up in the Gulf of Alaska, and it was going to send a 20-foot swell down the coast of California. Mm -hmm. So I looked at my charts and I said, well, it's going to be coming from the north, so where would I find a good place to anchor that's sheltered from the north? And that turned out to be a little place called Stillwater Cove, ironically, which is in, um, um, not Monterey Bay, but Carmel Bay. Oh, yeah. And it's a beautiful spot, and I've been there before, and it's usually dead calm, so I thought this will be a great place. So I go in there and as the swell starts to build, it wraps around the point 180 degrees. Oh no. And the swell is so big, it's not like your normal waves. It's like the tide coming in and out every 20 seconds. So it wraps around, goes every place, and I anchor to the deepest part of the cove because I knew that waves are going to break as it gets more shallow. So for a while I'm congratulating myself on being so smart to be in the deepest part of the cove because either side of me waves are breaking. <clears throat> but where I am, they're not. But over the next few hours the gap starts to close like an Edgar Allan Poe story. It's getting <laughs> narrower like and narrower <laughs> and narrower and building higher and higher and higher. And I realize I better get out of there. Yeah. But by now it's so rough 
that uh, pulling up the anchor is problematic and behind me these huge waves are smashing violently on the rocks and I knew that if the boat got blown back into those rocks the boat would be destroyed and so would I. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty dicey. So I got a second anchor ready to deploy in case something happened on the way and I set it up so all I had to do was throw it overboard and it was set and not foul. And uh, I started to pull up the anchor and got hit by waves which were now breaking on me and I was, no, this is going to take too long, I can't do it, I've got to cut it loose. So I've got the engine going, the, the anchor is under a lot of tension now and uh, I don't know if you've ever cut a line that was under a lot of tension but it just kind of explodes when you touch the blade to the line. You don't have to saw through it or anything, you just kind of go, and it goes pow! And then I ran back to the helm, put the pedal to the metal, and pointed the boat into the next incoming breaking wave. Oh, no. And the bow of the boat goes up. To me, it seemed vertical, and the <laughs> wheel comes down into my belly, and I go, I hope I make it. And I made it, obviously, and yes. got out of there and anchored in 60 feet of water instead of 15, which is where I was, uh -huh. and everything was fine. But yeah. that was quite a lesson and quite terrifying at the time. Yeah, wow. Now on another totally different type of sea story, um, I was anchored um, off of White's Cove in Catalina. And for people unfamiliar with Catalina, all the good anchoring spots are now filled with moorings. So any place you can anchor for free is going to be marginal at best and the shore is very steep too, meaning the water gets real deep real fast. So I went in there and anchored and sat and watched where the boat was going to drift and it was one of those nights where there was essentially no wind so boats were just kind of randomly drifting around with the current and I could see I was getting too close to another boat that was there first so I tried taking a little road in to get further away and I still was too close and, and there was a, a man sitting in the cockpit of his boat just watching what was going on and so I, I walked o uh, over to the back of my boat and said, sorry I can see I've anchored too close to you, I'm going to pull up and, and move. And he says, oh, he says that's okay, don't worry about it, I'll keep an eye on things. And I said, well, thanks a lot, but I don't think you should have to stay up all night just because I anchored too close to you. And he, nice. says, he says, oh. It's okay, I don't mind, I'm retired. <laughs> so, of course, I cracked up and moved the boat anyway. Yeah. But th those moments are really kind of nice. You do meet a lot of nice people you out there. You do. Right now, and that's probably yeah. one of the most surprising things about cruising, even though I've been told this by many people who've cruised, the best part is the people you meet and the friends you make. And even knowing that going in, it was still kind of a pre pleasant surprise how nice everybody is, how helpful they are, and how easy it is to make new friends. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just other cruisers, I mean in Mexico, the Mexican people are just so warm and so open and so friendly and so forgiving when you butcher their language. <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap things up, George, do you have any tips or ideas for people that are considering cruising? Sure. Uh, I guess the, the, the most important one is do it. Don't be afraid to do it. Um, there's nothing about it that's brain surgery, but there are 10,000 little things to know. And part of the pleasure of it is you never stop learning, but if you go about it prudently, the most dangerous part will be the drive to the marina. <laughs> so my advice is to learn, start learning. Oftentimes people are looking for somebody to go out with on their boat. If you have friends with a boat, ask them if you can go out on it. Uh, cruising and racing are two quite different styles of boating, and there's things to learn with each. Uh, if you join a yacht club, their racers are off, often looking for new crew, and many of the skippers are willing to teach you as a newbie. You will really get good at boat handling and sail trim and sail handling doing that. You will not learn anything about anchoring. Um, not necessarily very much about weather, although you will learn a lot about reading the wind 
and anticipating local conditions. So take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, there's lots and lots of books out there. Uh, start a little bit at a time. Cruise on other people's boats. Learn about boats. When it comes time you get your own boat, start smaller and simpler, I think. Uh, because many times you won't know what's important to you and what you like until you have some experience behind you. All boats have trade-offs. Uh, there's no single right answer. There's no best boat. You've got to find out what's important to you and what you're willing to give up to get it. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. My pleasure. Signing off from Circadian.
And there you go.